so we know now that the microchannels control the attachment spreading and migration of cells. We know we can use them to control orientation of cells, and by controlling the orientation of cells, you control the extracellular matrix that they form. Organized cells make organized collagen. That's something that we know from embryology and from wound healing. How do we apply this to an implant surface now? Well, the way we did it was we started back in the early 90s in trying to make laser machine surfaces. And at one point, I won't show you the bad ones, but we had a whole load of failed prototypes. We were working with three different laser machining companies, um, and we were at the really cutting edge back in the early 90s of what laser machining could actually do. And we worked with a guy named Charles Naiman, who was a laser physicist who unfortunately passed away a few years ago. But he developed what's called a large area masking technique that allows us to make whole bands of this surface. And the way we do it is there's a pattern mask that goes into the low intensity part of the laser. And each time you pulse the laser, a little bit of the material here gets, gets moved, gets melted, and it re-solidifies on the ridges. So these are the grooves and these are the ridges. And so these micro-channeled surfaces that we made in culture turned into these microchannels uh, on a metal surface. And this is it on a curved surface. This is a prototype with a laser micromachine collar. And this is done using an Exmer laser. Um, and we've gotten very good at doing these surfaces over the years. And this is the first surface that was used on the BioLock implants. Now what we did with these, and well before I get into what we did with these, I want to make a distinction here is that um, there are other surfaces that are called microgrooved surfaces. They're not the same as this surface. Uh, these surfaces are called microgrooved. So are these. Uh, this is a 30x. This is our collar, which you can't really even see the microgrooves at 30x. But at 300x, you can see that the repeat spacing on this surface. Here's a, a what they call a microgroove, and there's another one down here. Here's a microgroove. There's another one down here. You know, they're in, the, they're in the range, the repeat spacing is in the range of 250 or 200 microns, while our repeat spacing is either 16 microns or 24 microns, depending on whether we use an 8 micron surface or a 12 micron surface. So we are literally an order of magnitude smaller than the surfaces that, that, that other people are using for this. And the reason for this is we're working on a cellular level, and we're the only people that are really working on a cellular level. Now, what did we do with this surface? Well, we did some animal screening studies. Um, this slide shows in a screening study how bone, which is the mineralized bone here is in red, grows directly into the microgrooves. Um, the microchannels are shown here. Actually, what's happened here is this is a bone structure that's been deproteinated after the metal surface was removed from the surface. So what you're looking at is the bone mineral structure here. And you can see where the bone was attached to the microchannel surface. You can see all of the, uh, the patterns left behind. And you can also see that each attachment is organized along the microstructure of the surface, along the microchannels. This uh, slide is actually from a, a similar study, but we had microchannels running in two different directions on this specimen. This part of the specimen had microchannels running this way. This part had the microchannels running this way. And we ended up with two completely different organizations of bone right next to each other in the same specimen, which tells us that you can use these types of surfaces to control the architecture of the tissue that attaches to them. The way this works, and this is another, this is process just like these. This is, has the metal removed. It's been deproteinated to show the bone structure. And you can see the osteocyte lacunae. These little red arrows show where the osteocytes were in the surface. You can see that the osteocytes are organized and that the organized osteocytes, we feel, make organized tissue. And this is something that we call directional osteoconduction because we see the bone attach to the surface and then move directionally along the surface. Now, how do you apply this? Well, we looked at the old way of thinking, and in 2000, um, the main way people were thinking about bone loss around dental implants was that the way you were going to put a dental implant in is you were going to start here and you were going to end up here. The biologic width being established was going to require the bone loss of a millimeter and a half to two millimeters or more of bone. And we looked at that and we said, that's really not what our thinking was at the time and we don't really think we have to do that because a lot of the implants that were around were literally designed to lose bone. 
So we designed this implant, and we did an animal study. And the, the, this is a very important slide because it shows what the rationale was in 2000 for what we were doing. This implant has a 0.5 millimeter machine collar. It has a 0.7 millimeter band of eight micron microgrooves that are about five or six microns deep. And then it has a 12 micron microgroove band that's 0.8 mi millimeters wide. And it's designed basically so that you sink the bottom part of the collar in the bone and you leave a little bit of the laser machining in the soft tissue. Now, I don't want to imply that the eight micron microgrooves are specific for soft tissue attachment. The only reason we did it this way is in 2000, the periodontists were telling us we couldn't put texturing on an implant surface without getting plaque formation. And the eight micron microgroove surface was very effective at preventing epithelial migration. And it's also an easier surface to clean if it gets exposed. Both surfaces will attach soft tissue. Both surfaces will attach bone. So there's a number of different ways you can, you can place this implant. The speakers following me are going to talk about that. Um, but we did an animal study on this. And actually, this is an electron micrograph from that study that shows that you can get direct bone attachment to the collar of this implant in an animal study. And the histology that we saw from this animal study was really striking. This is in a dog study, and it's, and it's a loaded study, where three months after implantation, you, you did a, put a loaded prosthesis in. And this is three months after restoration. And this is the machine collar. It's this portion of the implant. And what you can see is this blue line is the epithelium. And what happens is that when it hits the eight micron microgrooves, there's a little blue burst of epithelial cells, and the epithelium stops. And then below this is fibrous connective tissue attachment. The lower part of the implant shown here has direct bone attachment in the 12 micron microchannels. If you look at the later time period, it's even more striking. The tissue is more mature here now. You can see the sulcus that comes down this implant, which is really coming down the machine collar. It ends right here, which corresponds to this spot. You can see the blue epithelium here, and it stops. This is transitional epithelium on an implant surface. The, the epithelium stops there, and below that, you've got connective tissue attachment, um, and our control implants, of course, dogs don't brush their teeth very well. So in some cases, you've got a lot of plaque formation around the implants like this one. Uh, but in most of the cases, what we saw was complete lack of bone and soft tissue attachment, and you would get bone that would die down below the collar. And, and so this was rather striking for us because we, we knew we could get bone attachment to these surfaces, but the, the level of soft tissue attachment was rather striking to us for, for what we saw. So the results of that study indicated that you could use this surface to integrate implants through multiple tissues. We were integrating implants now with, with epithelium, connect, connective tissue, and bone. And so we're beyond osseointegration now. We're now talking about integrating tissues on three levels, and it's the first surface that's really microengineered to do that. And so we did a clinical trial with the Group for Implant Research in Italy. Um, and essentially what we did is we wanted to ask these questions. Can we reduce crestal bone loss, establish a stable soft tissue seal, and would we see problems with sulcular uh, bleeding or plaque index? And this was a uh, prospective controlled study that controlled, that used pairs of implants, a laser machined implant versus a control implant. And it's the same design was done in 15 patients, 20 pairs of implants. And what we looked at in particular was crestal bone loss, probing depth, uh, plaque index, sulcular bleeding index, and as, like I said, 20 pairs of implants in 15 patients, and this was done over a three-year period. This is a typical case uh, from Orlando Ciccarelli, one of our clinical investigators, that you can see the time zero, two months, and what you start to see by four months is that the laser machined implant has still has bone attached to the collar. However, the control implant has started to lose some bone and the, and the bone is beginning to die back below the collar and that's the beginning of the process. What we saw over time was this. Crestal bone loss is shown on the left here. Um, the typical crestal bone loss you would see around a two millimeter collar like our control collar is about 1.9 millimeters of bone loss on average over, th over three years. Uh, the laser machined uh, collar, the laser microchannels prevented that. 
We only got about 0.6 millimeters of bone loss over three years on average, uh, and it was statistically significant from about uh, seven months on in the study. The sulcus depth measurement or probing depth measurement we did showed a difference right from the beginning that got even greater over time where the sulcus depth was shorter on the laser microchannel surfaces, suggesting that what we saw in the animal studies was also happening here, that the connective tissue attachment was preventing the epithelial migration and we were getting a shorter sulcus around the laser machined implants than we were around our control implants. The plaque index and sulcular bleeding indexes, both of these are a zero to three scale and we're only showing the zero to 0.4 end of it. Now for plaque index, for instance, zero is no plaque, one is plaque you can see with instrumentation, two is plaque you can see with the naked eye, and three is rampant plaque formation. And essentially what this means is that in this study we had mostly zeros with an occasional one and there was no difference at all between the, the laser uh, and the controls. The same in the sulcular bleeding index, you start a little higher right at the beginning and the, the, the the bleeding index gets a little lower over time. And again, we're dealing with a zero to three scale and we're only showing zero to 0.6. So there's really saw no difference at all between the laser micro machined implants uh, and, and the controls in terms of uh, anything uh, that could be considered dangerous from a periodontal point of view. And this is probably because the uh, laser machine surfaces we don't see much exposure of them. They get very good soft tissue attachment uh, and, and that seems to protect the surface. Now, this is um, from Carrie Shapoff. Carrie is, is our longest clinical investigator. Uh, he put in our first prototypes uh, almost nine years ago. And he calls this left slide, of course, this is a machine collar implant. He calls this the reality of implant remodeling. Uh, where you get saucerization, you don't start with, you started probably with bone at this level, but after time you're going to get saucerization and bone loss. Same here, you probably did, you probably started with bone at this level, but you lose a lot of bone around most implants. Um, this is one of, uh, uh, a one millimeter prototype that we made very early on that only had the 12 micron surface on it. Uh, this is a one millimeter prototype after four years of implantation. The Micro gap is right here, there's only a one millimeter collar and the bone is still attached to that collar after four years. Um, this is one of the two millimeter collars, this is the newer design uh, and this was one case where he just has a very nice x-ray that has bone at the collar at two years that's still where it was uh, when it was placed. And Carrie insists, and he has some great x-rays too that show that he thinks we have bone densification around the collar because of probably the loading aspects of it. Uh, but we see very healthy bone around these collars uh, after fairly long periods of time. And that's demonstrated in this case, which is my favorite of his, um, because he scared us half to death with this case. This was the first prototype we ever sent him. And it's a one millimeter collar implant. The micro gap is right here on the implant surface. All right, so this is only a short collar with the 12 micron microgrooves on it. And it was the first one we sent to Carrie, and we said to Carrie, don't put this any place visible. Don't do any grafting around it. We just want to make sure we're not going to get any surprises with this implant, so don't do anything crazy with it. So what does he do? He puts it in a central incisor and a woman with a high smile line. He does bone grafting around it, and he does soft tissue grafting. And this is what the implant looked like at six months. This is what it looked like at three years. You can see where the bone height is. This is what it looks like aesthetically at five years. And we just got this x-ray a couple days ago, which is eight plus years. It's actually close to nine years, I think, now. Um, and this is where the bone is. And actually, the bone looks really healthy around this implant. Uh, and it has not moved since it was placed. And so he's really happy with this. Uh, Carrie uses these implants for uh, aesthetic restorations uh, pretty much exclusively uh, because of the stability of the soft tissue and bone around them. So what have we got here? We've got a, a surface that works. It's a cellular engineered microchannel surface that uses contact guidance to control cells and tissues. has a very high surface area which mechanically interacts very well with the tissue. By orienting the microstructure perpendicular to loading, 
you allow stress transfer between the collar and the surrounding bone. We've actually done finite element analysis that suggests that this greatly lowers the stresses around the implant collar, especially in side loading. Uh, and we've actually published a paper on that in Journal of Biomedical Materials that compares the finite element analysis with the histology that we've seen, and the patterns are very similar. Um, the end result of this is we seem to form a stable soft tissue seal above the crestal bone, and the laser lock surface allows load transfer, preventing over or under loading. So whether you're a proponent of the idea that the loss of bone around an implant is from the microgap or from formation of biologic width or whether it's from over or under loading, we're solving both problems here because we're, we're separating the microgap from the tissue below it by forming a stable soft tissue seal and we're allowing load transfer between the collar of the implant and the surrounding bone. And the end result of this is we're limiting crestal bone loss to 0.6 millimeters as opposed to what you normally see with implants which is in a one and a half to two and a half millimeter range. Uh, over, over a couple of years. Now, one of the things that, that was pointed out to me is that this was the first implant that a lot of people had seen that formed a supercrestal biologic width, which is what you can see here. And by all, by all you know, methods, this really, this implant was placed way too close to the buccal plate. This buccal plate should be gone. And this was in the dog study. But the buccal plate's still here because it was attached to the surface. And yet, in most of our controls and in other studies, what we see is the soft tissue creeping down into this, into the, uh, in between the implant surface and the bone, and you end up with a subcrestal soft tissue attachment. Why does that happen? Well, my theory is that during normal wear and tear, you disrupt the connective tissue, you disrupt the epithelium, and eventually that epithelium and soft tissue attachment creeps down to a point where it is mechanically sustainable and it has to be mechanically protected from damage. That is usually subcrestal. It's in between the bone and the implant. That's where it's protected. On the laser microchannel surface, the epithelium and connective tissues attach firmly enough to be mechanically sustainable in a supercrestal position. And I think that's why we're seeing the supercrestal uh, tissue attachment. And by the way, I hate the term biologic width. Um, people ask me all the time whether biologic width exists around teeth and around implants, I mean, and I don't see really how it can because you have a different structure around an implant than you do around a teeth. Uh, I would really much rather it be called a tooth transgingival complex or an implant transgingival complex. I was trained as an anatomist, but we like descriptive terms, and biologic width is not a descriptive term. It doesn't tell me what it is. It actually should be biologic height, shouldn't it? <laughs> so, anyway, we've got an implant now that, that integrates tissue at multiple levels. We've got an implant that acts as an epithelial barrier, it acts as a soft tissue attachment zone, and we don't see periodontal ligament formation per se because we don't have cementum here. What we do see is a very stable soft tissue attachment that seems to act like a series of little O-rings that forms in the channel and, and it keeps the tissue from moving around and it's very stable. Um, and, and you'll see more about that in a few minutes. And we get very good bone attachment on this surface as well. So we're really integrating tissue uh, on three levels with this surface. Uh, the FDA uh, allowed us three claims, which the FDA does not like to give people claims. When this was approved by the FDA, we had to beat them over the head a little bit with the data, but we got this claim that this collar has been shown to attach soft tissue. Nobody else has that claim. We also got the claim that this implant has been shown to retain bone around the collar. And that's another claim that nobody else has. Like I said, the FDA does not like to give out performance claims unless you really give them some serious data. And because we have so much data on this surface, because it's really the first evidence-based surface that's ever been developed for a dental implant, they allowed us these claims. And it's just because we've been working with it so long that we have the mechanistic data, we have the animal data, and we have human data on it now. We know more about this implant surface than anybody else knows about any surface. And this implant also has shown no safety concerns regarding plaque formation and sulcular bleeding. Now, we've had three studies that have been going on with this. One's an implant-supported denture study at, at, at Univers University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey. Um, this study is at NYU, and you're going to see some of the cases by Stu Fromm. And this study you're going to see next 
which was done by, by Dr. Myron Nevins and was just recently published. And it's a really exciting study. And between what he's going to show you and what Stu Fromm is going to show you, I think you're really going to love this. Um, what, bio, what BioHorizons has done is create a next generation of this surface. If you look at our original surfaces, they look like this. We've, they've had to change the machining parameters a little bit to put this on a more complex surface. For instance, this single stage implant has a curved collar. It's not easy to produce this surface on that collar, but they've done a beautiful job of it. And this is it on the one piece. Now the single stage is now available. But this is the way this surface looks now. It has tremendous amounts of surface area, even compared to the original implant. And I think this is going to be an absolute killer surface. Uh, it is, it, it, the profiles are just absolutely um, consistent on this surface. Uh, it is really a well-made surface. So this is really a second generation surface now. Of course, this is the first implant that was available, the tapered internal implant. Um, and uh, this one, we think, is just, uh, just really a nice implant, and people are getting really good results with it. Um, we're not stopping here with it, actually. We've been talking to some orthopedics people. Um, this is a very easy surface to dial in on any part of an implant. We can do it on plastic, metal, or ceramics. And there are situations like transcutaneous prosthetic fixation where you have pin tract infections that begin to form. And one of the problems we may be able to solve is that pin tract infection problem because the pin tract infections form because you don't get skin attachment to these implants. And we think we can probably produce implants for transcutaneous applications that don't have that problem now. We've actually already done preliminary studies in rabbits. This is actually a laser machined implant uh, in a rabbit uh, that was put in the skull through the, through the soft tissue. And this is, dye was injected into the sulcus here to see where the dye stop. And you can see the dye stops here, and you've got soft tissue attachment down below this. Um, so even in a rabbit, which has very elastic soft tissue, um, we can get connective tissue attachment um, to, to this type of surface. And there may be other applications, too. For instance, the pontics on lens implants, uh, you, could, you could texture those so you would get better soft tissue attachment and better fixation of the lens. There are a lot of applications wherever an implant crosses tissue boundaries where you might be able to use this technology. There are a whole bunch of people who have worked on this project. Uh, in particular, Harold Alexander, Charles Naiman, and Sally Frankel are very good friends of mine who are very, very innovative people. And a lot of very innovative people have worked on this. Uh, I happened to be in Bologna a, a, a couple of months ago. And I was at the, I got a tour of the old anatomy dissection labs. I teach anatomy, among other things. So I was very excited to see the old amphitheater the University of Bologna is the oldest university in, 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 in Europe, and the oldest medical university. And, and one of the statues that's in the anatomy amphitheater is Gaspero Tagliacozzi. And I just had to put him up here because I think this is such a great picture. This guy is another, you know, he's a real innovator. In, in 1580, he developed a pedicle graft technique where he would literally fix a person's arm to their face and grow a pedicle graft to reconstruct the nose. And he's the father of the modern rhinoplasty. And he developed the pedicle graft technique in 1580. And the, the reason I like the picture is that is a nose that he's holding in his hand, <laughs> which I think is very elegant. And at this point, I think I'm going to turn this over to, to Dr. Nevins. If there's any questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you.